Being with your changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean's developer cloud makes it simple to launch in the cloud and scale up as you grow. They have an intuitive control panel, predictable pricing, team accounts, worldwide availability with a 99.99 uptime SLA and 24-7, 365 world-class support to back that up. DigitalOcean makes it easy to deploy, scale, store, secure, and monitor your cloud environments. Head to do.co slash changelog to get started with a $100 credit. Again, do.co slash changelog. What's up? Welcome back, everyone. This is the Change Logo podcast featuring the hackers, the leaders, and the innovators in the world of software development. I'm Adam Stachowiak, Editor-in-Chief here at Changelog. Today, we're talking with Johan Voss about his new book, Quantum Computing for Developers, which is available to read right now as part of the Manning Early Access Program. Stay tuned to the end of the show to learn how you can get your free copy. We talk with Johan about the core principles of quantum computing, the hardware and the software involved, the differences between quantum computing and classical computing, a little bit of physics, and what developers can do today to prepare for the perhaps not so distant future of quantum computing. So I think we should probably start by getting everyone on the same page because quantum computing is a place where I think a lot of our listeners and probably the three of us come from you know, very different places in terms of our understanding of it. So Johan, first of all, thanks for joining us, but then also explain to us the core principles of quantum computing and how they're different than what I'm used to and what everybody's used to right now. Right. So thanks for having me. Quantum computing is um, actually very, very different from classical computing. There are some misconceptions and people sometimes think that, well, computers are getting faster every year and CPUs are getting better. There's more memory. And then a quantum computer is probably just the next step to this. But that is not true. It's actually completely untrue. A quantum computer has not much in common with a classical computer. The main difference is every classical computer that has been built in the past 50, 60, 70 years or so is built on top of transistors, very small electronic pieces that uh, decide whether there should be current or not. And a quantum computer is not built on uh, transistors. So the fundamental building block is very different. And as a consequence, the, the concepts of quantum computing are very different as well. The core concept of a classical computer is a bit which can be zero or one. And mm-hmm. all the processing in those bits and all the logic and all the algorithms are based on zeros or ones. All the characters and all the flow is based on zero and one. And in a quantum computer, that is not the case because a qubit, which is what you can call the equivalent of a bit in a quantum computer, can be zero. It can also be one, but it can also be a combination of zero and one. And that is, of course, entirely different from a traditional computer. And while that may sound strange, it actually is not strange because nature is all about quantum mechanics. And the computers that we have today are pretty artificial because we exclude what we call the superposition. We say that every bit should be zero or one. But that's not how nature works. There are states that are a combination of zeros and ones. So a quantum computer is much, much closer to to real nature Mm. than a classical computer. Are you saying then, I guess just for a one-to-one, if someone's familiar with, say, quantum mechanics or any nature of physics, if they're somewhat familiar with the quantum realm, or if that's science fiction or not, if, if they're familiar with that, does a lot of it transfer in terms of quantum computing mirroring reality? Yes, yes. So quantum computers are totally leveraging the principles of uh, quantum mechanics. So, And for example, if you're a bit familiar with quantum mechanics, you know that electrons can have different spins. They can be in spin up or spin down or in a combination of uh, spin up and spin down. And that actually applies to quantum computing as well. A bit can be zero, it can be one, or it can be a combination of zero and one. So there are fundamental particles that can have uh, a property that is sort of undefined until you measure it. 
And that is one of the core principles of quantum mechanics, uh, the uncertainty. Until you make a measurement, the property is not really defined. And that is the same core idea of quantum computing. As long as you don't make measurements, the system can be in a superposition of all the possible states. Hmm. What does that look like? You mean from, from a physical point or from a computational point? Well, let's take them both in order. What does that <laughs> look like from a physical point of view? I guess you don't look at it because once you observe it, it's no longer in that state. Yeah. Observing it actually changes it. So it's which is sort of a recursive loop is that it is what it is until you observe it, which changes when you observe it. So are you observing it prior to the change that you influence by observing it or it gets really a mind spin? Yeah, and then you come close to the philosophical questions. Does it exist before you observe it or does it right. exist Ooh. because you observe it? Right. And you can go very, very far with that. Now, what I do recommend is not to think too hard about this because... <laughs> okay, I can you, do that. Yeah, you won't do much more <laughs> anymore. So, so I prefer looking at mathematical equations without trying to have an interpretation because it's mind-boggling. But yes, indeed... If you look at it, it falls down to a classical state again. So if you look at the qubit, if you try to measure it, so we know that it's 0 or 1 or some sort of combination, if we measure it, it will always be 0 or 1. And in a complex quantum system with many qubits, there can be a huge amount of uh, possible states. But once you observe it, it will fall back to one state only. So... That's one of the biggest challenges with quantum computers. You should not look and you should not be able to look because once you observe the system, it falls down to a classical state. And that is one of the things that makes the hardware of quantum computers pretty challenging. Any measurement of the system or interaction with other components will cause the system to collapse to a base mm. state. What does an observation look like? Give us some, like, some degree of an example of uh, observing. Yeah, now that this becomes tricky because <laughs> I don't know anything about hardware, to be honest. <laughs> but it depends on what type of quantum computer. So um, I'll, I'll sort of circumvent that question. For example, um, Google and IBM, they are mainly using subconducting quantum computers. So they are cooled to a very, very low uh, temperature, few millis uh, of Kelvin. But there are others, for example, Honeywell uh, announced uh, last week a quantum computer based on trapped ions, which is a completely different system. But in most cases, by applying lasers, you can manipulate the qubits, whether it be trapped ions, or electrons or photons or whatever. And then in order to get a measurement, somehow you need to have them interact with um, other particles. And then you measure the effect of that particle. So that's in general in physics, uh, in elementary physics, things that happen if, for example, the double slit experiment, you send a beam or you send particles through a slit and then you measure their reaction when they encounter uh, other particles. So it's all about um, indirect measurements. So the moment that the qubit that you want to measure interacts with another elementary particle, you can, based on the properties of that second particle, you can detect the state of the qubit at that moment. So mm. it's then already zero or one. So you cannot detect a superposition. You cannot detect whether it was 70% zero and 30% one. Um, so you will always measure zero or one. Mm. And what's the point then of quantum computing? Why is quantum computing important, considering, I guess, the difficulty of observation? What's the goal? Yeah, that's a very good question. And it's not easy to answer. And uh, um, I struggled with that question for a very long time because, well, you start with, let's say, eight qubits. And with these eight qubits, you can have uh, two to the power of eight superpositions. And you can do all kinds of processing with all these combinations, so 256 combinations in this case. But ultimately, you need to do a measurement, and you're back to eight qubits that have fallen into a classical state, so you end actually with eight bits. So that seems like there's no advantage over classical computing, because it may look like a black box, and then you're telling your uh, audience, yeah, but inside this black box, everything turns into gold. And once it comes out, it's wood again. So, for example, you tell your audience, we put wood in this black box, there it becomes gold, all shiny, and then when it comes out, it's wood again. And your audience will ask, so what is the value of this? Mm -hmm. So, 
the mind shift that um, developers need to make is that in many cases, the outcome is not important, but the process is important. Sometimes you're not interested in the outcome of a problem, but in the process that you need to follow to, to get an outcome. And the quantum algorithms that we know today and that uh, people are working on today are mainly looking into this area. For example, let me give a very fictive example because there is no known quantum algorithm that is going to do this. But imagine that you have 100 uh, numbers that are randomly sorted and you want to know the highest number of this. Mm -hmm. What you do typically in a classical computing is you can do some bubble sort or uh, some quick sort or whatever, and right. then you will uh, get the highest number. So the result of this problem is one single number. And a quantum computer might be able to do this just in one run. And, that's, uh, and, and the result is then, again, only one single number. But the fact that it could do the processing so much faster than a classical computer is where the real uh, gain comes from. And a more realistic example of this is uh, finding the periodicity of a function, which is something that's actually at the core of a Shor's algorithm, which we might come into, which is supposed to go into break uh, encryption. Mm -hmm. Finding the periodicity of a function is something that you can do on a classical computer, but it's going to be much, much faster on a quantum computer. And the input of uh, uh, this is just a function, and the output is just one number. So you don't need much numbers in the end to prove that this is faster. You just need one number. And if you can do the processing part much, much faster, then you gain something. Hmm. So you mentioned you don't know very much about hardware. You obviously know a lot about software. Both things are in play here. And one thing about quantum computing is that it has been very much the realm of academics and researchers so far because of the hardware problem, it seems, probably both problems. But what's the state of the world? Because it seems like quantum computing has been a threat or a technology that's always been next year, two years. Like, it's always coming, but it's never come yet, at least to the mass production phase. It's kind of like IPv6, you know, it's going to be here eventually. It's, although IPv6 has been here for years, <laughs> we're, just, we're just not using it. But what's the state of the hardware? You mentioned IBM and Google are doing some things. Catch us up. Yeah, well, actually, quantum computers are already uh, being used, but not at the scale that one envisioned. But, for example, you can create entangled particles um, and use those to, um, to do secure encryption. There is already hardware that allows to do this. And with systems that can uh, work with one qubit only, you can already do a few things. Now, what people really think about when they hear about quantum computing, it's, uh, um, well, the first example that most people talk about, it's about breaking encryption. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, how far are we from uh, breaking RSA? And that's very difficult to answer. And I personally don't think that this is the most important application in the short term. But anyway, how far are we from this? Well, <laughs> that's hard to say again. Initially, people thought that the number of qubits is what defines how far we are in quantum computing. So similar to uh, classical computing, remember six, uh, 640K would be enough for all applications. Mm -hmm. And then computers became bigger and bigger, so memory increased. And one would uh, assume that this procedure would also be followed with quantum computers. So we start with one qubit. You cannot do much with one qubit, but then two qubits, four qubits. Uh, eight qubits, and then the question is how much qubits do we need before we have something that can really be worked on? And more important, how many qubits do we have today? Well, the question is not so much about how many qubits because it would be not extremely difficult to get a quantum computer with a large number of qubits, but they have to be stable for a long enough time. And that is another problem. So getting a large number of qubits is one thing, but uh, having them stable for a long enough time to do some processing is the other thing. Because as we said in the beginning, if you measure that system or if there somehow is interaction between the system and noise, then your calculation is over. So the quality of the qubits is extremely important. So at this moment, we're at about 50 or 100 uh, qubits that are sufficiently uh, stable to do something uh, useful. And... I think this is good enough for um, developers to, to start working uh, with it and to start 
experimenting with software on top of real quantum hardware. It's going to take a while before we have quantum computers that are strong enough to break encryption, but it is not going to take a long time before we have quantum computers that can apply encryption. And that is something, for example, at the QTech department of Delft University of Technology, they hope to achieve that in uh, 2020. So this year, they want to show a network of quantum computers, very small quantum computers. You only need one or a few qubits uh, in order to have them interact with each other and send messages in a completely secure way. And I think that is going to be a first widespread application of quantum computing. And it's maybe not as uh, popular as breaking encryption, but guaranteeing encryption is, I think, for financial institutes, healthcare, everything where privacy is important is going to be an important aspect. And I think that give it a year or so from now, and that should be achievable, not yet for everyone at home, but it should be used in between banks and different industries. So correct me, or tell me if I'm hearing you correctly. It sounds like you're saying that before quantum computing is powerful enough to break our current tr traditional encryption algorithms, it will have produced its own new style of encryption that's more secure and unbreakable. Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. Oh, well, that's good news. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it? I suppose, yeah. Because the scary thing is like, it isn't going to break everything, you know? And I was starting to think like, well, I was thinking about the progress of these things. And I was like, if I was a nation state and I wasn't interested in like telling everybody how far I've gotten, I was curious how close we are to like, could, could nation states have already pr privately developed the hardware to do this or are we too far away? And it sounds like, well, before we get to there, we're already going to have options. Yes, exactly. Okay. So that's the that's a reassuring order. So we will first have secure uh, communication thanks to quantum computing before we have yeah breaking of the encryption. Now you never know of course what um nations or um big companies uh, are already building. Yeah, what they're capable <laughs> of behind closed doors, right? Yeah. But the difference between the requirements for a quantum system just to do secure encryption are much, much simpler than the requirements for a quantum system that breaks uh, RSA encryption. That's interesting. Of course, if I was a nation state and I had broken RSA encryption already, I, wasn't, I wouldn't tell anybody about it, you know? No, but there might be signs if you had this. For example, with the same uh, quantum computer, you could also trick the whole Bitcoin system and do the mining. And so, so you would see that in the Bitcoin price, uh, for example. And now, not to worry people, but even if we think that breaking encryption is 10 years away, that is still something to worry about today. It's not that long. It's not long and it may come back to you because your bank transactions that you're doing now, if they are intercepted, and you don't worry about them because, buh, whatever, they are secure. Or your messages that are, um, uh, you're using a secure messaging application and you're sending messages to each other. And you don't care that they're on a server because, buh, they are encrypted. Hmm. If someone steals those records, they are encrypted. They can't do anything with them now. But in but 10, 10 years, years from now, they're yeah. going to be, yeah. yeah. So imagine what this, uh, for example, communication between two presidents that is encrypted and that yeah. they assume that no one will ever see. And then in uh, 15 years from now, uh, someone wants to make history and he has those messages and he decrypts them and uh, um, that might shed a new light on history. Interesting. That might be kind of cool, kind of like the Freedom of Information Act. You won't need an act for that. You'll just have freedom of information because you'll have unlocked like, you know, 50 years of communications that were previously private. I mean, yeah. As long as there's like a statute of limitations on that information or something, maybe not be all bad. Well, especially with open government and open data and, you know, the, the availability of some of this data. I guess in some cases that's really just literally open, not encrypted. But at some point having public access to past conversations of 50 years ago presidents. Right. Hmm. That's interesting. I'm actually less concerned about public officials having their communications publicized eventually as I am private citizens having their private conversations publicized, right? That's more concerning in my opinion, but either way, that's interesting. 10 years from now, because you think once you've got it encrypted across the wire, you're, you're fine, but that data at rest is going to be resting there for years and years and it may come back and, and bite all of us. 
be careful out there. Yeah, the the in parentheses not yet. So it's it's private or it's encrypted for now might be a better way to say it. Because it's encrypted today, but for now. Well, Johan, you got us all depressed and scared over here. <laughs> That's right. Bring bring it back to the, the Perk qubit. Perk us up. Perk us up. Yeah. I'm curious, you'd mentioned about this idea of a qubit and stability, which I'm still kind of grok what you mean by the hardware. It sounds a lot like it's tied to literal physics, meaning literal particles. The computer is not just simply, uh, I, I guess, I, even in classical computing, it's, it's photons, right? Like, how does a computer run today? Electricity, right? Is that photons? How does it change once it goes into quantum realm? Does it, or to the quantum Lasers. Computing? Yeah, I mean, is it is it based upon like a stability of, a, you know, an a actual particle? Yes, sort of. Now, so I hope there are not too many hardware experts listening because they will kill me. <laughs> but one of the cool things, if we go from classical to quantum, so you know that they try to make transistors smaller and smaller. Right. But we're now at the, the smallest possible uh, uh, dimensions of a transistor because uh, so a transistor is actually meant to block electrons to go from uh, one side of the transistor to the other side. So if it should be zero, then no, f- there should be no flow. So it then blocks. But if you make them smaller than they are today, there can be an effect called quantum tunneling that still allows electrons from one side to sort of magically spooky appear on the other side. So that is a hard limit on uh, transistors in classical computers today that you can't make transistors much smaller than today. So that is also why Moore's law is uh, slowing down or coming, coming to an end. And in quantum computing, that's uh, different because there you actually want those quantum effects to happen. But uh, stable is actually a difficult word because what does it mean, uh, a qubit that is stable? So the real difficulty is that you can bring with lasers a photon in a state where it has a spin-up and a spin-down, or it is actually a combination of a spin-up and a spin-down. Uh, but it's tricky. You, it's, it's very hard to maintain it in that state for a long time. But you want to do lots of processing on that state, and that's really uh, mind-boggling how you can do that. So you want to have that particle interact with other particles, and without actually measuring those particles... And if you do something slightly wrong, then uh, the system will collapse into one of its possible base states. So all the combinations of 0 and 1 are going back into either 0 or 1. And that is what makes it hard to um, keep them stable for a long time. The moment that you look at it, it's gone. Yeah, even describing look is difficult to like look how do you look at it you know what i mean like what is this the idea of observation and looking is very challenging to describe as well absolutely so observations is one of the most difficult aspects in uh, actually in the whole quantum physics and it's funny that we uh, we talk about this for for a long time because this is actually what i avoid <laughs> in the book <laughs> because i mean how many software developers know about how a transistor is working right Personally, I find it extremely interesting. So all the the physics behind quantum mechanics is extremely interesting. But it's very hard. The core point of what I try to do with this book is explaining to developers that they do not need uh, a PhD in um, physics to work with quantum computers, similar to how they do not have a deep understanding of how transistors work, but they can still write applications. Nevertheless, it's really fascinating and I love to um, to discuss all the hardware aspects. It's just, this is difficult and mind-boggling if you start thinking about it, especially the thing about observations. If you, um, I read lots of papers and I watch lots of presentations about that concept of observation and where exactly does the observation uh, happen and what causes reality and consciousness. And, but that's going to bring us a bit too far, I think. In this new world of remote first, more and more teams are looking to build video into their apps. Everything from media publications, education and learning platforms to communities and social platforms. If you're trying to build video into your app, you're probably deciding between having full control by building yourself or faster dev cycles with an out of the box platform. 
Well, Mux gives you the best of both worlds by doing for video what Stripe has done for payments. In a world of complicated encoding, streaming, multiplexing, and compression, Mux simplifies all things video to an easy to use API to make beautifully scalable video possible for every development team. Mux lets you easily build video into your product with full control over design and user experience. Videos delivered through Mux are automatically optimized to deliver the best viewing experience, and you don't have to deal with the complaints about rebuffering or videos not playing. Get started at get.mux.com slash changelog. They're giving our listeners a $50 credit to play with. That's over an hour's worth of video content that you can upload and play with and check out all their features, including just-in-time publishing, watermarking, thumbnails, and GIFs. To get the credit, just mention changelog when you sign up or send an email to help at mux.com and they'll add the credit to your account. Again, get.mux.com slash changelog. to our friends at Manning for hooking us up with some free copies. Stay tuned to the end. You can win a copy of the ebook. And it's very practical. So we've been talking about the highfalutin, hard to understand, mind-boggling aspects. And I think the hardware and the physics and really the paradigm lead to that. But when it comes to software developers, first of all, we want to dive into the book and what you're here to say to developers today in 2020 about quantum computing. But I'm just curious why write a book so practical about something that seems so, at least today, impractical in terms of it's out there? Why now and why write this book? Yeah, surprisingly, you're not the first one to ask this question. So I prepared the answer. Uh, well, actually, do you remember the Millennium book? The Y2K? I do, Y2K yeah. bug, yes. When did you think they start working uh, on that? In 1999, December 31st? Uh, probably before Christmas, at least. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's the thing you want to be prepared for when something big is happening. Mm-hmm. And we discussed uh, uh, breaking encryption. So do you want to be A, the first one, or B, the last one to break encryption? And especially um, if you want to guard yourself against this, if you want to use secure uh, communication, this is not something that... Uh, I mean, we try to make the software as easy as possible, but it's at this moment not something that you will just download from the internet and you have it running. It takes a while before you really understand the benefits and how it works. And so it's better to uh, start working on it now and to understand what is possible and how you should uh, program for it so that your algorithms are um, ready by the time that real powerful quantum computers are there. Or even for if you want to do secure communication using a quantum key distribution, that is really not extremely far in the future. So if you program that now and you have it on real quantum hardware in a few years from now, it's really the time, today is really the time to start looking into this for another reason as well. Even if real quantum hardware is still not yet widespread available. Mm -hmm. Quantum simulators in general are available today. And while they are, of course, much slower than uh, what we expect real quantum hardware will do, their behavior is expected to be exactly the same as the real uh, quantum computers. So you can test your software already now and you can run it on quantum simulators. And that allows you to create all kinds of applications and to see which part should be quantum written, which part should be classical written, uh, because we have those quantum simulators that are um, exact predictions of how it will work on real quantum hardware. And that is something, of course, that we didn't really have with uh, classical computing, because there was no pre-classical computer. So it was hard to work on algorithms for classical computers when there were no computers already, but now we can Mm -hmm. use classical computers to simulate quantum computers and to write software for quantum computers. Yeah, I think there's a huge opportunity whenever you have something that's just on the horizon, but seems to be obviously a step forward or a paradigm shift for those forward-looking developers to get accustomed to it today, so they're at the forefront uh, tomorrow makes a lot of sense. One thing that you you said here, which you also write about in the book, is how quantum computing isn't going to take over classical computing insofar as I'm not going to have an iPhone that just has a quantum computer in it. You mentioned there'll be 
most likely a CPU, you know, maybe a GPU, and then also this Q, a qubit processing unit because quantum computing is not better at everything. It's better at very specific problems, and classical computing is better at other problems. What are the things that quantum computing is really good at? We talked about breaking encryption, but surely there's other uses of, of this technology beyond that. Where does it really shine and where would I as a developer say, well, I'm going to turn to quantum computing for this particular problem I have and classical computing for this other particular problem I have? So that's definitely true. So quantum computers are not intended to create a web page uh, or so. That is not the goal. And sometimes uh, people wonder how large is the potential field of quantum computing versus classical computing? Is quantum computer yeah. just a special case? Well, actually, I see the other way around. Quantum computers are very close to nature. They are natural. They use natural uh, building blocks, uh, elementary particles. And classical computers are special cases where we put everything in zeros or ones, which is pretty artificial, but very useful for, for example, user interfaces. Uh, uh, and so now the fact that quantum computers are so close to nature make them already applicable for all kinds of uh, problems related to nature, and I'm talking about physics, medicines, biology, if we want to understand the interactions of molecules, it is extremely difficult to model this on a classical computer. Even the three-body problem is extremely hard on a classical computer, so the interactions between molecules or the moment that uh, we talk about complex molecules, that's, that's impossible to simulate uh, with a high enough precision on classical computers and because why is this because those things are by definition quantum mechanical and the best way to simulate something that's quantum mechanical is with quantum computing which uses quantum mechanical characteristics as well so there it is very useful the consequence of this is that it is also that quantum computing is also in general very applicable for complex problems where, as we said earlier, a qubit can be in the state zero and can be in the state one and it can be in a linear combination. And this allows to represent two possible states with one qubit, four possible states with qubits, eight states with three qubits. So that is an exponential function. So many problems that are exponential definitely can benefit from quantum computing. And this is why breaking encryption or so is one of the uh, areas where quantum computing will outperform classical computing because that is an exponential uh, problem. And without going into the mathematical details, it actually means that if you make the problem uh, twice as big, the time required to solve the problem can become twice as big, that's not a problem. But if it becomes exponentially bigger every time mm -hmm. that you just add one uh, bit, then it's soon impossible to do with a classical computer. And with a quantum computer, that is more easy to tackle. So those problems that require exponential computational power, so that if you make the problem slightly bigger, that it only becomes somehow harder to solve, those are candidates to be uh, dealt with by quantum computers. I wonder about things like machine learning algorithms or teaching. Thoughts on that? Yes. So that is one of the areas where I think that quantum computing will, not in a very short term, but in the longer term, be really beneficial. Uh, and that's machine learning. I think we made great progress in machine learning over the past uh, decade or so. But still, if you look at how difficult it is for uh, uh, I mean, if you ask a computer to do to to calculate the square root of a five-digit number, it will do that immediately. While a human needs more time for this. But if you ask a computer to detect a rabbit from a dog on a picture, you need to feed it with thousands of images before it can really do that. And the algorithms are getting much better. But uh, for example, if you do deep learning, um, this requires lots of uh, uh, linear algebra and matrix calculations. Now, if you can leverage the power of quantum computing, where basically those things can be mainly done in parallel, then there's going to be a tremendous uh, speed up in this. And I think actually that many of the hard problems in AI 
can only be solved uh, if you also apply quantum computing to really increase the power of the mathematical algorithms that, that need to be performed in order to do this. What are some domains where you don't see quantum computing making big waves? Well, everything related to user interfaces is something that's uh, very subjective, where you don't need to be fast, but you just need to be right. Mm. And there it's less applicable. Which is hard too, because, you know, what I know of a computer personally is what I see. And so to go beyond what I see is difficult. And that's why it's difficult to grok this quantum computing because it's it's unlike anything I've personally seen before. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But that going to be a bit philosophic again, that brings us back to the original uh, uh, question. You're talking about what you see and what you observe. Now, that's not quantum anymore. At that moment, you lost a quantum state. <laughs> you've, right. gone to, you've gone classic again. <laughs> but yeah. everything that is needed before you make that observation is quantum. And as Richard Feynman said, nature isn't classical, it is quantum. So if you mm. want to study this, you better need a quantum computer. And in the end, the observation that you make, yes, that is classical. But everything that is behind this observation that causes you to be possible to make this observation, that is actually quantum. Yeah. And a an analogy I heard, or a metaphor of, of like expressing this as if I can see a car moving and I can predict, okay, I see that car going from here to there to the, say the stop sign or whatever. But at the quantum spectrum of things, you're predicting, you know, a crazy amount of particles, the prediction, you're predicting where they're going. So as a car, as a large object, I can see that the car is moving from here to there, but you know, I'm really predicting a massive equation based upon my visual knowledge of the direction of the car. It's some area of the quantum realm, it may not actually play out that way. Yes, that is one of the, the bigger problems in physics in general, of course, that is the laws of quantum physics pretty well understood at the uh, elementary, at the level of uh, elementary particles. So one particle may be in a superposition, but how does that translate to larger uh, bodies and larger structures like car or so? That is a problem that's extremely, well, that, that is puzzling the greatest scientists of the last uh, couple of decades. So mm. I think it's uh, pretty hard to solve. Mm -hmm. So bring this back to ground level here for a moment. You say they will not create quantum algorithms for applications that will benefit from quantum computers, but they will use existing algorithms. So for those out there maybe overwhelmed, like myself, can't totally understand it, this is approachable, and that's what Johan's book is trying to do, is to make an approachable way for right. Joe developer, Jared developer, to just become aware and know how to use these things. So use existing algorithms. And you do say that developers who know the basics about quantum algorithms, why they're faster, how to use them, et cetera, will have an advantage. So have we been discussing the basics of quantum, quantum algorithms, or is there more to that conversation that we haven't touched on yet? Well, we didn't really discuss that yet, because that's another uh, discipline. So actually, quantum computing for developers is multidisciplinary. So we talked about the hardware. Mm -hmm. I don't know much about it. And if we talk about the algorithms, that's mathematics. You don't need to understand the hardware to create right. algorithms, but yeah, it helps a few PhDs in uh, <laughs> mathematics in order okay. to create um, quantum algorithms, and which the typical developer does not have. Right. So the question is, bruh, what now? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. What now, Johan? Tell us. Uh, what's the? Give us the the bootstrap to this then. Yeah, what now? Yeah, one of the main goals that I'm trying to do with this book is to explain the fundamentals behind those quantum algorithms that are created by those bright mathematicians and how developers can benefit from these concepts. I think it's extremely hard to come up with uh, completely new quantum algorithms. If you think about it, there are only a few known popular quantum algorithms. People that are in uh, quantum computing for a while, they will know Shor's algorithm, uh, Grover, Deutsch-Chossa, and a few others. But there are not too many of them. So, And that's what I want to make clear. 
if you are a developer, do not expect that you will um, tomorrow create your totally new quantum algorithm. But those quantum algorithms are based on some concepts that might be applicable to your particular application. For example, in the book, we discuss the deutsch josa algorithm. And that is a very simple quantum algorithm, which in itself does not do something very useful. But what it does is it allows to detect some properties of a function very fast. And whatever that function is, that is something that is independent to the algorithm. And the property that we examine in this Deutsch-Josser algorithm is whether a function is balanced or not. And that means, is the function always giving the same result or is it sometimes returning a zero and then a one and then a zero and then a one? And we show that if you want to do this with a classical algorithm, it's going to take a fixed number of uh, uh, iterations. And a quantum algorithm can this do in just one uh, iteration. So, and by explaining this uh, with some real uh, Java code, it becomes clear to uh, developers that, okay, if I have a similar problem where I need to find out if this very complex function that I don't know what it is actually doing, but I'm just feeding it some input and it's giving some output, if I can maybe transfer my original problem into this problem that's already been solved by quantum mm. computing, then I can benefit from quantum computing. So that is actually the one of the key takeaways that I try to give with this book is that we explain a number of quantum algorithms. And if you think about your own problems that you have to solve, if you think how you can transform your original problem into a quantum uh, problem, then you can use and uh, then you can apply that quantum algorithm and transfer the result back to your original uh, problem. So you benefit from the hard work already done by the mathematicians that came up with the algorithm and you benefit from the quantum hardware, but you didn't have to create your quantum computer and you didn't have to come up with this bright quantum algorithm. You only need to make sure that you can see where those quantum algorithms might make sense in your particular problem. Super deep stuff, obviously. It is quite mind-boggling, as you said a couple of times already. Like, it is very... This is very deep stuff, and the whole using of quantum for a developer, I think, is even more interesting because you have to think about literal physics and the way things work and how you can benefit from that. And leveraging mathematicians, hey, that's awesome. If you've got two PhDs and I've got none, I want to leverage that. So that's that's great that it's even available, and you're making it practical for very much so Java developers. Like you're clearly, in quotes, a champion of, of Java developers and, and Java as a language. Tell us about that. Yes, so one of the problems that I think quantum computing is facing is that there are some very brilliant hardware engineers, some very brilliant uh, mathematicians and physicists working in this area. But in the end, if we want to make this successful on a large scale, then we also need, of course, software developers that are experienced in writing enterprise software, that are experienced with uh, uh, current encryption, that can work with uh, scalability and software in general. Now, the gap between these two worlds is at this moment pretty big. And what I try to do in this book is leverage a huge amount of existing developers and, and explain to them that quantum computing can also be used from their language and well all my examples are java based and java has about uh, 12 million uh, developers that are very good in java programming now if quantum computing becomes uh, uh, more popular it would be a pity that those developers have to learn a new language so why can't we make quantum computing um, accessible to Java developers because that will immediately, well, immediately give us 12 million quantum uh, developers. So if those Java developers can uh, leverage the quantum algorithms that are being developed, then those quantum advantages can be used by 12 million developers. And that can create huge opportunities for um, not only those developers, but also the projects that they are working on. It's not going to be easy to have uh, 12 million quantum developers anytime soon. So going that way is going to be difficult. But I think it's going to be easier to make this 
quantum algorithms accessible to Java developers and then have 12 million developers that are leveraging quantum computing, which is not exactly the same as 12 million developers programming quantum computers themselves. So that is what I want to avoid in the book. So you can use your regular Java uh, skills to create those applications. How often do you think about internal tooling? I'm talking about the back office apps, the tool the customer service team uses to access your databases, the S3 uploader you built last year for the marketing team, that quick Firebase admin panel that lets you monitor key KPIs, and maybe even the tool that your data science team had together so they can provide custom ad spend insights. Literally every line of business relies upon internal tooling, but if I'm being honest, I don't know many engineers out there who enjoy building internal tools let alone getting them excited about maintaining or even supporting them. And this is where retool comes in. Companies like DoorDash, Brex, Plaid, and even Amazon, they use retool to build internal tooling super fast. Retool gives you a point, click, drag and drop interface that makes it super simple to build these types of interfaces in hours, not days. Retool connects to any database or API, for example, to pull data from Postgres, just write a SQL query and drag and drop a table onto the canvas. And if you want to search across those fields, add a search input bar and update your query, save it, share it. It's too easy. Learn more and try it free at retool.com slash changelog. Again, retool.com slash changelog. Johan, I am reassured and encouraged as a working, practicing developer that I don't necessarily need to understand everything about how quantum computing works and qubits and quarks and superpositions. I don't have to understand all that stuff, and maybe with time I will, but right now what's important, preparing myself for this future, which is on its way and is kind of here but just not yet evenly distributed, as they like to say. The main thing is like understanding that it's out there, understanding that there are these algorithms which have extreme advantages, and there are problems that I'll come across in my day-to-day -day coding that if I can just rearrange the nature of my problems into a quantum computing-aligned nature, I can leverage one of these algorithms and have huge benefits. And I think that this book is really preparing many developers for that. So. I'm excited about that. Tell us about how, if I wanted to like dip my toe in the water with quantum computing, there's a simulator. I can't, I can't actually use any hardware unless I have access to something like that, which I don't. But there is an open source quantum computer simulator. And in your book, you, you go through coding the hello world. And so there's actually like code we can play with today, which at least gives us an idea of what it will be like calling into quantum computing algorithms in the future. So Walk us through that step by step. What's the software look like? How do I access it? Et cetera, et cetera. All right. So the quantum computing simulator that I actually started writing about before uh, I had the idea of this book is called Strange. And it's, it's a Java-based quantum computer simulator. Uh, it's on GitHub. It's open source. You can download it. You can play with it. And there are a number of samples that will uh, get you started. We try to start with the very easy samples and then become, well, introduce the concepts of quantum computing by showing more samples and then the concepts of quantum computing algorithms by showing even more uh, examples. Now, the fact that it is in uh, Java allows for um, many uh, of those existing Java developers to hopefully get an aha moment because the way we explain superposition, for example, is hopefully intuitive for Java developers because, well, I didn't use the word random uh, yet because it's a dangerous word to use in quantum computing. But a, a, Here we go again. I'm going to go over my head. <laughs> Why is it dangerous? Because there's no such thing as random in quantum computing or something? 
Well, yeah, we, we prefer to talk about probabilities. Oh. So we talk about, so a qubit can be zero uh, or it can be one or it can be a combination of zero and one. But there is still right. a probability X that you will measure zero and a probability um, one minus X that you will measure uh, one. Okay, So Makes sense. if X is 50%, then it actually means that there's one chance in two that you will measure zero and one chance in two that you will measure one. Now, this may sound familiar to developers in general. That's a quantum uh, number generator. And so this is how we show how you can write classical code to, um, to generate a random uh, number. Well, with just the random class in, in Java. But then we create a quantum algorithm that does the same by simply putting a qubit into a superposition state so that it's a combination of 0 and 1. And then we measure that qubit and by measuring that qubit, it will either be zero or be, be one. And if you do that, for example, a thousand times, you will see that on average, you will get 500 times a zero and 500 times uh, a one. And this very simple example uh, shows how you can sort of program a quantum computer because that is done with uh, similar to how a classical computer is programmed with, with gates. Um, a quantum computer can be programmed with quantum gates by applying a NOT gate, a C NOT gate, but also typical quantum gates like a Hadamard gate, which brings a qubit into a superposition. So we introduce those gates and we show how you can program them to create a random number generator, for example. Now, this is not something that in the end you want to do after... This is not the end goal of quantum computing, of course, but it makes the developer familiar with how a quantum computer works and how it resembles classical uh, computers. So we gradually add more functionality and I try with every sample, I try to show how you would do this in the classical way and then how you do it in the quantum uh, way. And this gets the reader more familiar with the quantum gates and the quantum operations that are possible. In the end, I still don't think that it is required for developers to understand everything about those quantum gates. Maybe even they don't need to know much about it, but it shows how the classical problem translates to a quantum problem, and that should help them when they are working on real-world problems, it should help them to detect which part of the problem can somehow be transposed into the quantum uh, world where it can then be dealt with by a quantum computer. And, well, the classical gates like a, a, a NOT gate and an AND gate, and so most developers understand uh, about them. But if you create algorithms, you don't think about those gates because you typically program in a higher level language like Java and so, where you don't worry about those gates anymore. And similar, while strange, so the quantum computer simulator allows you to program quantum algorithms with gates. I don't think in 20 years from now, if quantum computing is very widespread, that uh, many people will still be uh, programming low level gates. But therefore, the other part of Strange also allows to um, use quantum algorithms. And then they are implemented using those gates, but you don't need to know how these gates are really working. But in this book, it helps explaining concepts like superposition and quantum entanglement and so. What do you think is the logical conclusion of that abstraction layer? And what I mean by that is you're you're describing and you're walking through the reader at a very low level, you know, the, these gates and stuff, to, so, so, because you want them to learn, right, how it all works. But imagine 20 years down the road, I'm, I'm feeling similar to how I asked the TensorFlow team, I think probably five years ago, when we had them on the show to talk about machine learning and TensorFlow, when I said, when can I just call an API and get my result back out, right? When can I just say, hey, sentiment analysis, please, and just pass it some data and it gives me the sentiment analysis and I don't have to do all of the machinations that were required back then to do some machine learning and to train a model and to update it and manage all that kind of stuff. And their answer was, well, all that stuff is kind of coming, but it's not here yet. And I think we've seen progress towards that as a community where certain machine learning algorithms and models are available and I can take a model that's been pre-trained by a company and I can tweak it or whatever, I can call it and get my data back out. I'm curious if quantum computing has a parallel where I can just 
have some sort of Shores algorithm API down the road or or like super secure encryption, quantum encryption API. Is this a future that you see possible as a developer saying, hey, I can just call the quantum cloud and then get back my results and I don't really have to get into the nitty gritty? That is indeed one of the possible futures that I see. So you mentioned Shores uh, algorithm and then uh, one more. The super secret encryption yeah, algorithm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Quantum key distribution. Yeah. The, well, I don't know the names of these things. Well, I know Shor's algorithm because I, I read it from your chapter 10, but I don't know anything else. So yeah. I'm making things up. The quantum key distribution is actually uh, pretty cool, and that that's a short-term realistic thing. And I yeah. think I'm actually working on one more example for this. And actually, that might be part of an answer to your question as well. I don't think that in many years from now, developers will say, okay, now I'm going to use the quantum key distribution. They will use a Java socket, just like they do it now. And the internal implementation of that socket, uh, you can already uh, uh, do secure sockets uh, with the SSL socket factory in Java, but it can also, another implementation could uh, use quantum encryption. So you would just say at a very high level, I want to create a socket to this IPv6 address, uh, for example, and I want to give it property quantum so that the system try to, I think this will rather be in the underlying layers of libraries. And that is slightly different, I think, from the evolutions in uh, machine learning, where you always need a good model and you always need data scientists to do the analysis and interpretation and to do all those uh, uh, clever things. In quantum computing, I think it's going to be more hidden inside uh, libraries. But even then, you need to know which libraries you want to use for which uh, occasions. And that is still going to be a challenge. So it's, it's going to be partly similar than the way that machine learning in general is moving into, but it will be, I think, more hidden for the end developer. But then um, we're really talking about the long distant future. Yeah. In the meantime, there's a lot of work to be done and that we need developers doing that work, right? Building up those abstraction layers and the glue underneath for the rest of you know 20 years from now for me to just say, to my runtime, call this library. And that one happens to be backed by a QC algorithm or something. Yeah, exactly. So, so that then indeed the future that's uh, far away. I think for now developers that, uh, for example, are worried about encryption and that want to know about uh, quantum key distribution and Shor's algorithm, they still need to to pick those algorithms. And that is indeed something that I think at this stage you can compare it with the stage of machine learning because you somehow need to understand what you're doing in order to, to do something useful. Well, to give the concrete example of Shor's algorithm, what it is actually doing is, well, Shor's algorithm is uh, factoring integers. So it's going to say that 15 equals 5 times 3. And it does that not by brute force, but it does it by translating this problem to another problem. And the problem that it is translated to is finding the periodicity of a function, which I talked in the beginning. And it turns out that quantum computers are very good in finding the periodicity of a function. But if you want to break encryption, you still need to think about, oh, somehow I can translate this problem into finding the periodicity of a function and then I can use a quantum computer. You don't need to understand how quantum computers work, but you still at this moment need to realize how you can translate uh, finding uh, prime numbers, for example, to translate that to finding the periodicity of a function. It still seems kind of trapped in the mathematics realm based on what you just said there, like, at least currently. You know, Jared mentioned this future of I love the idea of this quantum cloud, Jared. I mean, when you said that, I was like, yes, we need that. But based on what you're saying is, is that it still requires some knowledge, awareness of the mathematics behind these algorithms and the usage of them to really leverage them to the full ability. That's why I hesitated giving this uh, uh, example until uh, now, <laughs> because... Um, well, yes, indeed, for Shor's algorithm, uh, it does. Yeah. To be honest, you need a fair understanding of mathematics in order to understand it. And that's why it's typically the number one algorithm that people know about when they hear about quantum computing. Yeah. And it's great and it's brilliant. And it's, oh, it's so nice from a mathematical point. It's, wow, it's fantastic. 
but it is not, in my opinion, not the most appealing quantum algorithm, or at least not the one that will immediately be most uh, popular amongst uh, developers. There are other things, and by just explaining the concepts of superposition and entanglement with those simple Java applications where we create a random number generator, and with entanglement, I have the analogy with a magician, so where you have uh, uh, two coins, you don't see them, you send one to another computer, and you can, based on what you measure, you know what's there on the other computer. That's more realistic down to earth and you don't need a PhD in mathematics for this. But understanding these concepts might already be helpful in translating some parts of your problem to quantum problems. And granted, for sure, the algorithm, yes, you need lots of mathematics. Yeah. I think it's important, too, to sort of rewind back to something uh, you had said in the blog post about this was is, regarding the book. You know, so with the book, the goal here is not to, you know, to be this end-all, be-all knowledge base of quantum computing, but but more so you want to give the 12 million Java developers out there the opportunity. And I think it's kind of the key thing is this opportunity to experiment. And so it's not like, hey, today quantum computing has arrived, use it, here's how, you know, do things. It's It's more so an invitation to experiment with this different way of computing that we're not familiar with or generally familiar with and primarily using Java-based computing simulators, in in this case, Strange and the things you've done there. So that's kind of key too, is that this isn't meant to be a Bible of quantum computing. It's meant to be an invitation of this experimental phase. If you haven't used yeah. it yet, here's a way to get in. An introduction. Yeah. And I would also say that uh, reading the book as a non-Java developer, that didn't give me any problems. I didn't actually go through, like, I didn't code out the things, but I read through the code. And so it's it's focused, the examples are in Java, it's focused on Java, but I would say that for all developers who are interested in quantum computing, I think it's approachable, regardless of your language of choice. Yeah, it, it is in Java because I you know that language uh, the best, but mm -hmm. actually... It is just any classical language that could have been used for this. Well, as you said, it, we tried to bridge the gap between the world of quantum computing and the world of classical computing. And I hear many classical developers, uh, Java developers, asking, hey, quantum computer, is that going to be something for me or not? And how do I start uh, on it? And I think there's an, an increasing amount of resources about quantum uh, computing and especially um, how the hardware is evolving and what the potential opportunities are. But as a developer, I also saw that some companies are getting nervous because they, do, they work with security. They have great developers but they hear that quantum computing might give opportunities and challenges. And even if it's still many years out, they want their developers to start understanding how it works. And I don't want to claim that after reading this book, you can start uh, creating your own uh, quantum algorithms that will be the best in the world or so. But at least what I hope is that developers will get a feeling of what is possible with quantum computing and it's not that strange thing anymore that's just going to speed up all their algorithms with a few orders of magnitude. It's something tangible that has some benefits, that has some challenges, but that might be useful for them today, in a few years, or in a long time. No matter what, it's going to take more than just reading the book before a developer becomes an expert in leveraging quantum computing. But that's also... Coming back to the very first question, why it's important to start working on it now. People that started working on the Millennium Bug started working many years before the problem was really there because it takes a while to understand it. And you want to be prepared for when it's really uh, there. Well, it's simple, right? It's just a year change. Oversimplifying <laughs> this very... It's simple, isn't it? <laughs> right? It's just a year change. They're, no big they're deal. They're just qubits. Right. They're just qubits, right? At the end of the day, they're just qubits. I like the idea of qubits and qbobs. <laughs> <laughs> your bits and your bobs? That's your right. Your qubits yeah, like and your qbobs. Yeah. Yeah, it's all the same thing. You just add a Q in front of it. That's, that's my takeaway. Uh, one other point to add to that, the Y2K analogy, uh, more on the opportunity front. So the people who really dove into... I'm looking at this on a parallel with machine learning. I just can't let go of it. The people that dove into that five years ago, seven years ago, 10 years ago, 
are making very good money right now. And I think the people that are going to dive into quantum computing and able to implement things and know about things and leverage this coming technology, I think will have opportunity at very good money. So if money motivates you, there's some motivation as well. Johan, I'm curious if there's a place where your average developer like myself could like keep up with the state of quantum computing, like kind of like see new things coming out and like new algorithms or without being overwhelmed with the maths and the hardware folk. Like, is there any sort of like approachable waypoints in a community? Is there a forum? Is there a RSS feed I could subscribe to just to like stay abreast of what's going on and developing in the quantum computing community? There are very good resources uh, if you want to track the progress of hardware. Unfortunately, well, unfortunately, most of the progress is uh, really in uh, academic uh, papers. The difference, if, if you want to make this more accessible, you risk into getting one well, of the more popular articles that just claim, well, we achieved quantum supremacy without saying what it actually means. And so that is difficult. However, mm. there is one resource I do recommend is uh, some of the companies that are working on a quantum computer like uh, um, uh, IBM, Rigetti, Google are creating excellent documentations and videos and tutorials. For example, QuizKit, which is the IBM quantum uh, suite, which has both a, a simulator and also access to their real experimental hardware. They have some great tutorials and great yeah, blog posts about it. So that's always uh, uh, interesting. And then I follow all the progress of QTech, which is that research consortium linked, associated with the Delft University of Technology. They have uh, very great and accessible tutorials about what quantum computing is, so more than just the hardware. But unfortunately, at this moment, I don't know yet of a, a, a simple list or RSS feed that makes evolutions in quantum algorithms for developers uh, available in the developer-friendly way. Yeah. Well, it sounds like an opportunity for somebody out there who's interested and would like to keep the rest of us yeah. updated with what's going on. A feed on that for developers would be, well, you get me subscribed, that's for sure, and probably many others as well. So the book is Quantum Computing for Developers by Manning. It's in Manning Early Access right now. Going to be done real soon now. <laughs> I think it's... Uh, we, we got access to eight chapters. There's 11 chapters. I think Johan has one or two sitting on his hard drive, haven't quite gotten uploaded to the early access program yet, but I'm sure we'll be there uh, real soon. Thanks to Manning, we do have a discount code for all listeners who are interested for all versions, whether the print book, which will be happening, or the current early access ebook. The discount code is PODCHANGELOG20. I do not know how much it takes off, but you can plug that in and I assume be surprised. 20. I would assume 20 as well. <laughs> and so we will link up the product page in the show notes. Please use that discount code to save yourself 20%. We've also, as I, as I referenced before, have three free discount codes to the ebook that we'll be giving away. Here's how it works. Pop open your show notes, hit discuss on changelog news, leave a comment on the episode page, Tell us something about quantum computing. Maybe an analogy that works well for you. Maybe you can tell us how confused you are. Maybe you can link us to a resource that is helpful. Or uh, just let us know something about it. We'll pick our three favorites within 30 days of the publishing of this episode, and we will hook you up with a free ebook. Excellent. Johan, this has been a lot of fun. It's been enlightening for me, uh, hopefully for our listeners as well. And uh, thanks so much for coming on The Change Law. Thanks a lot for having me. It was fun. All right, let us know in the comments at changelaw.com slash 387 what your thoughts on quantum computing are. Are you planning to learn about it? Are you planning to punt on it? Are you going to read this book? Let us know in the comments. Of course, you can comment on all of our shows at changelaw.com. Open your show notes and click discuss on changelaw news. We'd love to hear from you. You can easily support us by telling your friends, sending a text, sending a tweet, writing a blog post with your favorite podcasts. Whatever you do, we appreciate it. And as you know, the Change Log is hosted by myself, Adam Stachowiak, and Jared Santo. Huge thanks to Break Master Cylinder for the awesome beats. And of course, to our awesome partners, Fastly, Linode, and Rollbar. And we have a master feed that brings you all of our podcasts in one single feed. It's the easiest way to listen to everything we ship. Head to changelog.com slash master to subscribe or search for Changelog Master in your podcast app. You'll find us. 
Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.